I got a story for you. And now we go, bro. You ready? I'm ready? When I was a kid, right, my uncle was going to Italy for business. My aunt gave me these two suitcases. One my cousin Frank took, the other one I took. We walked from there, right here. As we approach with the suitcase, unmarked caravan and uh, undercover cars, and paddy wagons and cop cars swarmed this place. They took my uncle's suitcase that my aunt spent three days packing for him to go away on business and tore it up. Everything, like this, looking for something. Then they said they didn't find nothing that he has left. It took me a couple days to figure out what really happened there. They thought we was drug mules, running drugs in Bushwick, because half these houses were straight up just drug houses. They were moving just massive weight. It was like 1987. It was crazy, it was a crazy experience. My family came to Bushwick because at that time, a lot of people from Sicily, from my town, were coming here. You can leave the doors open at night, and you know, it was just basically community. In the 80s, it got ugly. There was the riots, I think, in 77, and things started to get fucked up in Bushwick. It was in the, in the 70s when there were the blackouts and the fires. Bushwick got its reputation for being incredibly dangerous because of all the looting. 3,776 people arrested. Thousands more fled the gutted stores before police arrived. I said, everybody else is still in Washington now still. If I was out there myself, I would've got what I wanted too. You were not among the looters? No, I wasn't, unfortunate. Around that time was also Son of Sam. So it was a very interesting time to be a kid living in Bushwick. In the 70s, it was I mean, how much can I tell you? I was always locked up upstairs too. I couldn't go outside at that age. Because <laughs> right. it was rough. Yeah, because it was rough. I mean, it was really, really rough. You know, you had your drug dealers, like, you know, you had your gang bangs. You had to always walk with someone. They didn't, parents didn't want you to walk by yourself. You know, back in the days, there was no cell phones. Beepers. <laughs> that was if it. That. If that. My name is Meryl Meisler. I was a New York City public school art teacher, and I taught in the neighborhood. This really looked like something I'd never seen. The schoolyard was You'd find a bed one day, or you could find some needles one day. There was no place safe for kids to play outside. And so they hung out in the abandoned buildings. Many buildings were burnt down for insurance purposes. There was a lot of abandonment while the Bronx was burning, and an announcement was made at Yankee Stadium. No one was announcing Bushwick was burning. Bushwick burnt to the ground. I'd see broken bottles, needles on the floor, burnt cars, fucked up buildings. I've seen people, we thought they were sleeping, but they were actually dead, and the cops came, and we were just in there watching them. Some people even in Queens wouldn't even come down here and play with us when we were kids at our house or in the street because their parents wouldn't let them because of all the things they heard and saw when they would come down. So, you know, I've never been embarrassed of it. It was, it was what we had. There were many factors that led to the decline of a neighborhood like Bushwick. Economic factors of the city as a whole, decline of employment, the lack of social services, white flight, neglect. So here was a neighborhood that was on the brink. This right here, this train station, this intersection, uh, Wyckoff and Star, this is uh, where my father in 91 was coming out, coming home, he just had to walk one block, make it home to uh, his family. And someone ran up on him, his back, stabbed him a bunch of times. They took his cheap dog tags from Sicily from being in the army. They took his money, killed him, left him for dead. We didn't know what happened to him for weeks. My mother thought he couldn't handle it and just picked up and left. After like a month, they found out what happened. Turned out uh, he didn't run away. He was a John Doe in the hospital because no one knew who he was. After that happened with my father, my mom was everything. She was limited. She had nothing, no education, no English, no family except for whatever is here. She never gave up on me and my sister and family. In uh, 2008, my mother got diagnosed with a brain tumor. It just 
sucked the life out of me to tell her her situation. And then she died. And everything that mattered was gone. When she passed away that first year, I didn't know how I was gonna handle that. And on the first Mother's Day, so I'm have a little party here in the community, paint some walls. The whole community came out. The artist painting on the walls was just, it was a great experience. I woke up the next day like I took a pill and I felt happy like I was a kid again. That party was great and it symbolized everything that I wanted. It was everything I had lost, which was family, you know? One thing led to another and we ended up, I ended up falling in love with, with, with street art and graph and I ran with it. In all of New York City, there's no free walls. There's no wall where an artist can just walk up to and paint. If you go to Germany or Europe or anything of that nature, you go to a shop, you buy paint, they could point you to four or five walls in their area where anybody could paint. You want to go paint a poem, paint a poem. You want to paint a character, you can paint a character. We have, in all five boroughs, we do not have one of those. So what Joe is doing with the Bushwick Collective is an amazing thing, and that's the closest we have in New York City to a free wall. Joe's just a good dude. He's like a neighborhood kid that basically transformed this whole entire kind of like neighborhood and allowed artists from all over the world to really come and paint. You know, he's just really instrumental in this neighborhood being curated into an art, street art gallery. When Joe started bringing the international artists here, it was like, it was like the neighborhood became alive. I can remember the first piece, it was like a beautiful oasis in the middle of the desert. So if you can imagine these blocks, bunch of warehouses around, nothing here, and then this Nick Walker piece in the middle of nowhere. The art really beautified the neighborhood. This guy is part of the community, is doing the work, rising the value of his community through art. For him to be like the defining figure and to be you know, the epitome of what that is, and he, and he be from Bushwick, it is remarkable. All these artists just love this. They're not making any money. They're sacrificing so much. So I said, I'm going to do something that helps these guys. It just it became something on its own for me here in Bushwick. My uncle came here in 1965. In 1971, he started the family business. This is GCM steel. This is where we make the steel curbs that go into the ground. When I'm not doing the Bushwick Collective, this is uh, where I work. I honestly don't know how I balance what I do uh, between Bushwick Collective and the family business. I, I didn't open up one day and say, I'm gonna be an art curator. It's not my thing. You won't catch me at an art show unless I personally know you and I happen to have the time because of my job takes up all my time and then this is no longer a hobby that I do on the side. This is a full-time nonprofit job that I'm completely out of pocket for, but you don't really think about these things when you're in love. And I'm in love with the whole community. I keep saying it's not art coming to Bushwick, it is Bushwick art. The art that you're gonna see is something that's related to what's happening today in our, in our world. And I think that that does bring a sense of community. People always write to me, how can I start this in my country and my state? And I tell them, listen, just do what you wanna do. Like, follow your heart. This is what I did. Make it organic, just make it breathe. Make it, make it, it's a life. Like life, you don't know how long you're gonna live. A mural will, will, will be for as long as it, it, it'll be. Eventually this will not be here, you know? I mean, it'll move somewhere else or something else will pop up, but eventually one day, like, the Bushwick Collective will not be in Bushwick. Everything in New York changes and you have to kind of like, come to terms with that or accept it. Otherwise you'll just be some old bitter guy. <laughs> It's great to see people. Where are you guys from? France, thank you for visiting. See what I'm saying? Like, no one ever gave a fuck about coming to Bushwick before, but now they do, you know? It's great. You know, you can't hate them for that. They didn't know about it. When I was a kid, they laughed at the fact that I told them I was from Bushwick. The people that come here and the people that are taking pictures and the people that want to be here is great because it's like, our neighborhood's just as important as any other neighborhood now in the world. The art is like a messenger of things to come. It added to 
the cachet of the neighborhood and made more people want to move here more businesses want to come here so the art was part and parcel of the neighborhood changing and kind of ushering in the new gentrification literally on every other corner that used to be a bodega is now a cafe or a bar they have gardens now and i'm like we don't even have a backyard like where is this space coming from we have Maria Hernandez Park right here that now has a dog park. You got kids skateboarding, people hanging out on the grass, all ethnicities, races and everything. Everybody's having a good time. 10 years ago, you couldn't walk through there without getting jacked, no matter what color you are. You still see a little bit of both the native Bushwick culture and a lot of the new culture. You know, I, I joke, but it, it is nice to be able to go out with like your boyfriend and, and get like a nice coffee or go out for brunch and not have to go out into the city or somewhere where we feel more comfortable. The neighborhood started transforming itself. Now it's just kind of like, it's a destination spot. This is kind of like no man's land before. It's kind of crazy what it's transformed to in the last couple of years. You know, this is like part of Manhattan almost, but it's still Bushwick. <laughs> It's Manhattan rent. As the neighborhood develops and gentrifies or more money enters the neighborhood, the advertisers will follow. It's just shitty to say, but there wasn't an audience out there that had enough disposable income to warrant advertising to them. Now that the rich kids move in, um, it's time to put some advertisement up because they're profitable. You've heard me say this before, like, the lettering is the icing on the cake. You know, like, we just want to make sure that the fuck cake doesn't taste like shit. Did you guys all bring your own brushes? My name's Paul Lindahl. I'm the co-founder of Colossal Media. We do hand-painted walls in every city, pretty much, between New York and Los Angeles. We are, without question, the first company in history to choose hand paint as its execution method. If you don't have the right thing to do the job, you got to say something, right? but I don't want you guys also to rely on me to put your fucking clothes on in the morning. We're going through a tough time because marketing guys are steering advertisements over here, coming in and putting billboards up over walls that we wanted to get, walls we had, slapping up an alcohol ad, a sneaker ad. Never met Joe before, uh, we haven't crossed paths yet. What he's doing out there is a lot of the reason that our clients want to be in Bushwick. I mean, people in Germany that are 70 years old ride fucking tour buses to go to Bushwick to see that stuff. So what that dude's doing is it's pretty rad. This wall was promised to the Bushwick Collective. We were gonna do it for free for the community, and we lost it. So now you can be told in 20, 30 foot high to drink fucking this beer. What's happening here is capitalism, uh, I want to say at its best, which means it's at its worst at the same time. The only reason those walls are even worth any money is because the Bushwick Collective put stuff next to it or around it, and now it's valuable. When the neighborhood was crime-ridden, drug-infested, none of these advertisers were here, right? A fellow like Joe gets all of these great international artists to come here, making this a destination spot, and then these advertisers come and basically reap the financial benefits of the groundwork that he's laid. It's pretty disgusting. We've been in Bushwick painting for like a lot longer than I think people understand. I think that just all of the excitement and energy and curiosity with Bushwick has escalated that very quickly. But for years we've been like, yo, you guys need to come to Bushwick. There's so much shit happening here. This owner right here, I don't care, I'll go right on camera, he's a dick. He's an asshole, he's got two faces. He seen me come out of the property next door. He was like, buddy, pow! And I was like, hey man, cool, what's up? Can we, you know, do something on your wall? We'll do it for free, it's for the community. Yeah, 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 buddy, yeah, buddy, yeah, buddy. Everything buddy, buddy. Four or five days later, I come here with, with uh, an artist who flew in, I scheduled it, show up with him, knock on his door, I was like, hey! He opens up a little bit, he goes, what? He wanted nothing to do with me. He said, no, 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 I don't want nothing on my wall. I was like, but we'll do it for free. And, you know, we bring the whole community around. No, 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 I don't want nothing on my walls. I don't care about it, I don't care. Now, people want to come here and put up these things. He gave in, he takes their money. We're doing this for free, and he's benefiting from it. You're welcome. This is so out of place. Mm. 
You know, we are Brooklyn. None of this is Brooklyn. None of it, none of it. The advertisers came to Bushwick because the, the art was there. They waited patiently to watch areas develop and grow. They knew to come in at the, when, the right moment. It was like, oh, if we go here, not only can we hit the local community that's the demographic now that we're trying to get, but also, you know, as a bonus, they do all these tours. Now, instead of taking them on tours of artwork, they're taking them on tours of artwork that are punctuated by moments of advertising. Outdoor advertising does this wonderful thing where it converts every single space in our city into a uh, potential profit, right? In the Bushwick Collective area, you have this really unique situation. Those walls, because the neighborhood wasn't developed, were not worth any money, right? Otherwise, the Bushwick Collective would have never happened. Now the advertisers are coming in and using it as an opportunity to sell their wares. So they're putting giant billboards up in as many places as they possibly can, including over some of the artworks, which I think is pretty aggressive. When you come out the L train on Wyckoff from Star Wars, my father was murdered. We had a beautiful piece up of a woman who lived in Brooklyn in the 40s. The artist's grandmother or something, he painted it. I see this thing on the wall. I'm like, what the fuck happened to my shit? They buried our mural behind this fucking thing. We spent three, four days painting this. We were very happy that we had the opportunity to do that. But then one day to come here and find it still painted and buried alive, it, it just symbolized what was to come. Our acquisitions team has on many occasions found legal inventory in Bushwick that has street art on it, but we said no. Have never and would never take out a piece of street art to put up advertising. It's not an easy decision just to say no. It means a lot. There's other outdoor companies that will say, yeah, I'll take it, and they do. We're giving our competitor the ability to make money doing what we do with one of our clients, and we're saying no to it for a grander reason, you know? So that carries a lot of weight, I think. Something like this, Owen Dippy from New Zealand saved up an entire year's worth of money. This is the one piece he wanted to put up, and he wanted to find the perfect spot, the right spot. He was refused by in Manhattan by some, and he tried to get this wall here. It's hard. These guys go through so much. They put in so much, like a whole year's worth of work from the other side of the world, like 10,000 miles away. And he was proud, he was happy. He, he, he was, it was worth the year's sacrifice to do this. What good story are you gonna tell me about putting up an ad over this shit? We all know that we have to coexist. I don't think they believe they have to coexist with us because they go into communities and do this. Eat all the meat off the bone and then just leave you the bone. You think they're gonna be there for you in the future to help you pay your rent? And there's no reason for them to be here anymore? They're Johnny come latelys. Because up until today, no one's proven me different. I love that fucking piece. Coexist is, 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 a, is a funny word, you know? They slapped me in the face already. You, you're coming here to take. You took in Williamsburg, you take in the city, and now you're taking here. You talk about coexisting then. Coexist, motherfucker. Contribute something. I said earlier, like, that dude has made that neighborhood interesting and beautiful to a lot of people, and a lot of people want to be a part of that. We've reached out to him a bunch in the past, actually, and haven't gotten the most positive response. And I guess maybe that's because he's got uh, a misconception on who we are, what we stand for, or what we're doing. Everybody's got their right to their beliefs and opinions. But I would suggest to him, give me a call, you know? Let's work together. New York's big enough for all of us. What Joe and the Bushwick Collective can do to stop the infringement of advertising on the neighborhood would be to go to the city immediately, talk to anybody at the sign enforcement unit at the Department of Buildings, convince them that these advertisements are going over community murals and that they're detrimental to the neighborhood. The city has control over where advertising can be put because you have to apply for a permit. And if those permits aren't going out, those advertisements are not going out. I'm not chasing anybody. Um, I want them to come to me and tell me that they want to help me. They know who I am. Why should I be chasing you to be like, please, please take the billboards away? Nah, it's not like that. This is life. Like, let it happen. We'll do what we gotta do. It's not unfair to explore the idea or the thought that the Bushwick Collective has been a part of raising the awareness to the neighborhood 
And the result of that awareness is businesses, billboards, you know, trendy restaurants, all that kind of thing. There's people in Bushwick that are not happy with the artist movement that's happening because they think it doesn't reflect their traditions or their culture or their history. It doesn't respect their history. When no one wanted to be here and everyone was running away and they stood in their homes during the crack epidemic and, and they were here throughout those tough times that they believed that they came out of. That's a soul of a, of a people there that don't want it to change. All of a sudden developments are everywhere, things are going to go everywhere. You're gonna lose those people that really made up the neighborhood and took care of it for as much as they, even if the neighborhood was burnout buildings, those people still were there living, dying, you know, building lives. They still have a right to have a say as to how that community evolves. I think that right has been removed. And I think, unfortunately for Joe, that art may indeed become a symbol of what's making their lives even harder. Joe has beautified an enormous amount of that neighborhood. That's not gentrification, that's love and passion. I, I think it's outrageous to make a connection between painting murals and gentrification. Does it follow us? Yes, it follows us. Joe was one of the many people in the neighborhood that didn't like something about the neighborhood and decided to make a change. The reason why gentrification happens in the worst neighborhoods is because the community gets together and says, look, we're tired of the way our neighborhood is and we're gonna come together to change the neighborhood. People move in because the neighborhood becomes better. The snowball effect happened because of that and we are where we are now. Artists are blamed for the process of gentrification and the rise in rents. I don't think we can blame them for that, right? The issue is people that are more wealthy are coming into the neighborhood and they're outpricing the people who used to live there, which is ultimately a housing affordability issue, right? We need housing to remain at a level that people can, you know, don't have to spend half of their income to be able to just live six stops out on the L. I mean, it's pretty absurd. Bushwick is overpriced. Over. Scratch expensive, it's overpriced. But because Bushwick is, you know, up and coming, and this is kind of the place to be, they don't mind throwing the money down. I mean, listen, if you can afford it, then more power more to you. More power to you, exactly. But for families like, you know, like us, it's, it's difficult. All that stuff around me is happening. The rent's going up, I can't control that. This is the community. You make what you make of it, and you try to hold on to the culture and the respect of what was here. But this neighborhood itself has been evolving for generations. I think at this stage in 2016, we're looking at uh, different waves of people coming to live here. You're still in Bushwick. Like, don't get it twisted. We live and work in Bushwick, and it doesn't belong to anybody, you know? People have always done large format paintings in New York and in Brooklyn especially, going back to the 70s. I mean, fucking watch Style Wars, you know? Like, it's dope that that guy takes ownership for what he did, but street art and graffiti and all that shit, it's always been there. If my mom never got cancer, we wouldn't be in this conversation. I wouldn't be here. I'd be doing something else. And whether I did this or not, this area still would have been a part of some sort of change. I didn't accept my mom getting brain cancer too well. I'm trying to learn to handle things differently when being faced with adversity and change. I think just trying to keep it together as a community is the most important thing. You know, for someone who grew up in Bushwick, you reminisce on the culture that used to be. It's changed dramatically, but I could still find hints of my childhood. I live in the present. This is where we are now. I never imagined it becoming what it has become, but I'm glad that it did for, for a lot of reasons. There's always two sides to a story. I can see the good things that have happened, but I also lament the fact that long-term residents start to feel like they're outsiders in their own neighborhood. You know, like when you're standing on the block in your own community and some person comes out and asks you like, can I help you? And you're looking like, no, you can't help me. I'm born and raised here. Like, who are you? Where are you from? Bushwick is a, is a place that seems to be at a critical point. To keep its greatness, you have to keep the great people in it. And diversity is part of its greatness and stability is part of its greatness. New York City is not a place just for super wealthy. That's the only thing that's constant in New York is the change. People can be bitter about the way it's going, but to be honest, it's like, be optimistic because that may, just means more opportunities for new things to kind of like grow out of it. Am I nostalgic for the old New York? The answer would be yes. But you know, to be nostalgic is just that, to be nostalgic. It's never coming back. 
New York City is a machine that constantly moves forward like a locomotive out of control. I do miss my old New York, but what's going on new now, I like it. I can't wait to 10 years to see what Bushwick actually is gonna be. Not New York City itself, but the Bushwick area, because it wasn't too good back in the days, but I, I'm willing to see. You'll visit me in another 10 years? Of course I will. <laughs> this will always be my home, always. This will always be my home. I believe the direction of where Bushwick is going is going to be positive. Williamsburg was rezoned where they put in 40, 30, and 20 story towers in the middle of neighborhoods that are just that weren't ready for it. With no infrastructure upgrades, no new schools, no new transportation, no new firehouses, nothing was built. In Bushwick, it's gonna be different. We're not gonna allow for these high rises to come up here. And we're gonna be able to stem the tide of speculation. It won't be the perfect or the only way to do it, but it's gonna help. When you see a limited number of new residents coming into a neighborhood, it, it makes it that much harder for you to use speculation to remove the long-term tenants of this community, which include artists. From what I understand, Bushwick still has a lively, active arts community. Those people seem actively interested in keeping that community solid for the arts. If they can get together with the old neighborhood and kind of stand their ground, I think Bushwick could be a really cool enclave of, uh, in the city. It is an optimistic view. It's probably going to be fucking condos and uh, suits in like three or four years, yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't see losing as an option. This is our neighborhood, and it'll always be our neighborhood. The hardest part is trying to get people to integrate their circles, to experience what each other's struggles are, and work on those common areas. Everyone has to work together. New York for me has always been kind of two things. It's been a place of like rapid progress and it's, it's been a place for creatives to like make their own rules. Bushwick is the latest example of that. And there'll be another new neighborhood where that happens again someplace else for some other reason. We are in business to make money. I don't want to be like defensive, but like there's more of that to come, you know? Like we're growing rapidly. We're planning on tripling the size of the company in the next five years. So, I can't throw a party every day, but I can do it once a year. We're coming up on the five year anniversary. The first block party we had was just an idea. What we want to show everybody at this five year is what Bushwick Collective has become. Make some noise, BK! The energy was amazing. I've done some block parties in Brooklyn. This by far tops it. I love the diversity, where people get to actually grow and learn from each other, being from all these different backgrounds, you know? You can see all walks of life not being afraid to walk down the street, as it was 20 years ago. A lot of places where you see gentrification, you don't feel it's hip hop. Brooklyn, you still get the feel of, of hip hop when you walk the streets. Definitely a heavy b-boy feeling when you walk in the spot, especially with the fumes of the spray paint as you come in mixed with the weed, like the way it was back in the days. The block party itself was great. It was a very busy day. A lot of people came and celebrated. And Certain aspects, I can learn from it. I mean, you know, uh, it didn't have enough sponsorship. Everything goes on my credit card. It gets depressing, you know, when you get the credit card bill. Just kind of it got away from me this year, financially. We set up a meeting to sit down with Joe a few weeks ago. Uh, we wanted to try and see if there were any like uh, similarities in our motivations and whatnot. It was nice to discover that there are a lot of them, you know? I sat down and I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here right now. And the first four sentences were uncomfortable. I don't know, it felt like a Wild Wild West shootout in the beginning. Like, you're just sitting there looking at each other like, what the fuck? There were some discoveries and there were some frustrations, but I mean, I think that that just goes with the territory, you know? And like, we cleared a lot of shit up. He said, Joe, anything you need, please. We're nothing like the other guys. We want to work with you, we want to coexist with you. 
I told him, at this moment, I'm wrapped up with the, with the block party, and I'm having some major money issues. We paid for a bunch of equipment for him because he was short money to do it, you know? That was us throwing in a couple of bucks. There's always going to be challenges in life. This project's going to have challenges and obstacles. Today, you know, that's, this is what my obstacles are. We're fighting for survival. We want to survive. It's something beautiful that we've found. Clean it off, dust it off. It's ours. Everybody in this zip code, and everybody in this map, and everybody on this globe, something beautiful we have. If anything, I just want this to always continue. I know I ain't gonna live forever, but I want the soul of the Busher Collective to live forever.